Good afternoon and welcome to the 43rd Car Lab Convention in Norfolk, Virginia. Today is 3-21-1916 and this is the... 2016. And this is the Learning to Change session. This is our 100th anniversary. I am Clark Baker and will serve as the moderator for this session. Our panelists are Dottie Welsh over here from... Nova Scotia, Canada is good. And Harlan Kerr, who I thought I saw San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to talk much. I want to let these guys do most of it. But I wanted to get started by saying that um, in addition to score dancing, I enjoy board games, German board games, games you've probably never played. But I'd love to play the games with you. And I brought a couple with me, not here today for the session, but, you know, some other time at convention. And you're going to go, but I don't know how to play the game. And I'm like, that's right, I'll teach you. So I have to teach almost all these games to people. Um, some of them are easy, short teaches. Some of them take a little bit longer. Some of the games play quickly. Some take a couple of hours. Um, the point is, whenever I say I'm going to teach you a board game, everyone's eyes are kind of like, oh, crap, I've got to learn something. And I'll start teaching it. And you can see about when they tune out. They're like... You know, about a minute or two or three in the, into the discussion, or maybe if they have more patience, five minutes in, their eyes are beginning to roll up and go, look, can we just start playing and show me as we go along? <laughs> um, and another thing when I'm teaching these board games is my wife always reminds me, my wife's back there, Miriam, by the way, Miriam will remind me, um, the first thing she needs to hear is what's the goal of the game? The goal of this game is to get the most points. You get points by doing blah, blah, blah. For that, you need money. This is the money. Here's where it comes from. And you build a structure on which she can hang all the knowledge. But if I started saying, on your turn, you roll the dice, and you do this, and you do that, and you do that, she would have nowhere to hook that information and not even know why you'd be rolling the dice or doing it. Teaching board games and teaching square dancing has a lot of stuff in common, and we're going to hear about that and how you explain square dancing to people or board games or teach them anything is going to be one of the topics of today. So with that as a kind of slightly off-topic introduction, we're going to have Dottie start, and then we will move on. I have a mic here, and I have... Um, when Dottie wants to, she can ask you for questions. We have a portable mic, so we can do that. We have handouts. There's a handout from Dottie. There's a handout from Harlan. And finally, I have a website where I had done a bunch of stuff on learning styles and stuff, and that's also here, so you can get that. So you should have three big, thick things to read. Here's Dottie. Good afternoon. All right. So... Clark kind of set the stage here. Because what did he say? Did, did, did you get... He just ignored me. He doesn't always... <laughs> 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 we're in the sun. Yes. Okay, would you like to do Clark's as well, as long as we're at this? If anybody wants to move forward, feel free. All right. So Clark just said when he teaches board games, he might not start out by giving that big tree of structure that Marion wants to hear. His tendency might be to do something else. And I think the biggest single thing I want you to take away today, if you haven't already learned this, is not all people learn the same way you do. And when you're teaching, you have to do your best to get into their mode of functioning and talk to them in a language that's good for them. It's not about what's good for you. It's about what's good for them. So the first thing you need to do is try to begin to understand what might be different. What is it that you yourself do and what do other people perhaps do? And what should you be looking for in order to figure out 
well, they think differently than I do, and they think in this kind of general classification, if we actually have a classification that's correct. So I'm going to start by talking about what, what has currently become known as learning modalities. That's a fairly new term. It used to be learning styles. It's, that's, the, the difficulty with styles is it can be applied to a lot of different kinds of things. And as Clark said, he did some research and he went in one place and he found this list and he went to another place and he found this list of stuff and he went to a third place and he found this list of stuff and he's soon saying, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure which one I could do, and that's why you have an incomplete, <laughs> as he says at the top, this article is not yet finished, which I believe is the one that I read. Okay, So he began to research it and then kind of got lost in the fog. So, and certainly true, there's a lot of different theories out there. What I'm giving you is what I view as the pieces that I think are most relevant to what we are doing. Okay, there's other things that would apply to people teaching in other kinds of situations or to other age groups or other kinds of skills and so forth. But the, I've found these things to be useful to me, and I think you will find them useful to you, but they aren't the only theory that's out there. Okay, so you need to be able to recognize learning modalities is just a big word. Modality means the way in some, which something happens and learning modalities has come to mean the sensory channels by which individuals give receive and store information so what are our five sensory channels smell one taste hearing sight touch okay I don't think we use smell or taste very much in the learning process in square dancing. <clears throat> Oz from California. I just wanted to add that there's actually some newer research coming out that indicates, not too surprisingly, that we have way more than five senses. For example, probably everybody in this room except for me has a sense of balance. And that is something, particularly as dancers, we need to be conscious of. Some people, um, my sense of balance isn't actually not having one doesn't affect me as a dancer very much. There are lots of people, for example, those who have Meniere's disease, for whom the sense of balance is wonky and really makes it difficult to dance. Okay. So, yes. And I won't deny there, there might be more. But for most of our purposes, that leaves us with three things. And each of those three things seems to be a primary method for some people to receive and store information. Okay, so on here, we start with the visual learners, which they say, some say, and they, these figures fluctuate a bit as to who you're looking at, but perhaps 30% of the population. The, in the quick sense, they see it, they picture it, and they write it down. Those are all visual kinds of things. So they primarily get other information by sight. They tend to say, I see what you're doing. Little word clues that you might not think about, they're significant. They take detailed notes and have good organizational skills. They learn well from diagrams, pictures, and written information. They like to read rather than be read to. And they have good spatial sense and a good sense of direction. Okay. Who just thinks that? fits them and maybe you might say two of these are good and the other one's not so good to you because you'll notice there's a mixed modality at the bottom auditory learners another 30 percent they hear it they say it and they discuss it primarily gather information by hearing tend to say I hear what you're saying or how to do it listen first take notes after if at all or rely on printed notes that's relevant Notice that I passed out these handouts because I, as a visual learner sitting in a situation like you, want that handout in my hand while the lecture is occurring. Okay, if you're an auditory learner, maybe you don't care about having it in your hand while the lecture is occurring. That's fine. You don't have to look at it just because you have it. 
Okay, but if I hold on to it saying, no, I'm not going to give this to you until after because it's all on here, I am one very frustrated individual out there. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, learn well from the spoken word and lectures. Like to talk and often repeat directions and enjoy discussion. Mm, you're saying to yourself, oh, yes, that dancer that says everything I say right after me like an echo. <laughs> Tend to look up or down. Close their eyes when they're trying to visualize something or trying to think about something because they're closing out the visual world and, 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 and thinking about what they've heard. All right, so how many believe that they're auditory learners? Three, okay. And then we have 30%, okay. Kinesthetic tactile learners, which is 15% of the population or thereabouts, so less. Less people are kinesthetic tactile learners, and, and by that sense, I mean only kinesthetic tactile learners. So these are people that want to feel it, and then they can do it. Primarily gather information through movement and touch, tend to say, I feel how this goes, tend to watch the teacher very closely. As a math teacher, that was the first sign that there were some people in my class that were kinesthetic learners because they would sit there with their eyes glued to me. And I would wonder until I understood about this, you know, what, what is it? Why, why does this person do that and the others? Different kind of learner. Need a self-determined learning environment, usually involving action. Exceptionally good at learning skills by imitation and practice. Okay, so they're learning to do a line dance and they stand behind you and you do it once and they've got it. Need physical information, so want to know how it feels to do something. That is the big key in terms of what we are doing in terms of teaching square dancing. And each different formation, position, and wall direction feels differently to the true kinesthetic learner. So these dancers need to be able to focus on one application at a time, and that really means one application. So if you're going to do right and left through, facing this wall is an entirely different world from facing that wall. Think about the implications of that in terms of how you teach. Okay? Do you, in fact, make sure that they get to dance it facing this way and also get to dance it facing that way? Because to them, it's an entirely new thing. And until they feel it, they don't understand it. Test. So I have a basement that's one square deep by three squares wide, and I was teaching a group, and we were teaching Relay the Ducey. And one of the people was a kinesthetic learner, and she eventually had to get out of the square and watch. And she's like, oh, when the long wave is this way, then it's blah, blah, blah. And then when I turned it 90 degrees, not understanding any of this, she's like, oh, what have you done? That's completely different. And she was thinking long way of the basement, long way of the big <laughs> wave, and relay the deucey. Uh, I was talking to Clark about this earlier. I have an C1 class I just graduated two year, weeks ago. I had this one st student who was, you know, told me I'm very much a visual learner, and whenever I would teach a new call, she would dance in the square in the teach tip, and she would sit out the next tip so she could watch the call being done because she had to watch it being done to really internalize it. Okay, so you're beginning to see how. We have to pay attention to the fact that there are at least three different things going on out there. And when you teach, you've got to reach out not in the way that you, not only in the way that is good for you, and you certainly have to do that because that's maybe 15 or maybe 30%, but also in two other ways that might not be instinctive to you, but because you know that somebody else needs that. All right. Other questions on those three things before I go on to a couple of other slightly different aspects of the what are the possibilities out there? Uh, just, the point I'd make, just, just the point I would make is and I watch because I my whole life has been spent in the field of education I watch callers teach and uh, one thing I've noticed 
every caller, if you watch them, they teach to their strongest modalities. So the way Clark learns is the way he will teach. The way I learn is the way I will tend to teach. The way Dottie learns is the way she will tend to teach. And we have to, as callers and instructors and teachers, get beyond that to address the other ways people learn. halfway does any of this change with um, Susan Snyder Jacksonville Florida do any of these change as age becomes a factor or if you're always a kinesthetic learner you're always I think I think at, 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 at a very basic level you're always the same however somebody that's gone through a lot of learning processes d taught to them in various and sundry ways develops techniques for dealing with learning when it's being presented in the wrong kind of way. Okay, so for instance, I'm not great at listening to a lecture and remembering it. I know, however, that if while I'm listening to the lecture, I take notes and see it on the paper. Sometimes I don't even have to go back and ever read it, but just the mere process of writing it down on the paper and looking at it is enough to deal with the fact that it came in in the wrong format. I made it the right format. So the older you are, perhaps the longer you've learned, had to learn how to deal with the fact that, oh, this isn't quite the way I'd like to see it, so what do I have to do to make it mine? Any other comments about that? Okay, yeah, um, by and large, most people's learning modalities are set before they're four years old. And as Dottie was saying, as people grow up, you learn to compensate and f for how your teachers are teaching because if you don't learn that way, you develop um, skills so that you compensate for the fact that they don't address your learning modalities all the time. But most of your learning modality is pretty much set before you're four and doesn't change much after that. Okay, so on the second page here I talk about some things that people have said about learning a physical skill and, it, and we we do have to admit that we are learning a physical skill. I, I Sorry, I skipped over the bottom here. I'm going to go back to this for a second. So we're teaching square dancing. What do we know about square dancing and what we are giving to the dancers? Well, first of all, on the mic, you are hearing the directions. Okay, so that that's arriving in an auditory format. And once you've learned things, that's all you get pretty much is that auditory input. And on top of that, we're asking them to do something in a synchronized way on a square with eight, seven other people. So there's some degree of need for spatial relationship understanding. And I know from talking to people that the, the degree of spatial understanding varies a great deal from dancer to dancer. I, right from the start, kind of had this visual image of the whole square. Some dancers, at least at basic mainstream and plus level, I don't think they ever really develop a full image of the whole square. They have an image of their little part of the square and know what they need to do, but they can't kind of visually look down on the thing and say, oh, well, if I'm here, my partner must be over there and da-da-da-da kind of, kind of information. All right? So spatial relationships, and of course, we're dancing, so what's that? That's a balance, rhythmic, listen to the music, feel it, kinesthetic action. So we are in fact asking people to have or develop three different, radically different kinds of skills in order to learn to square dance. So we need to, uh, you know, from the, from the beginning stages, that's something that you kind of have to keep in mind, that you may be taking them far out of their comfort zone initially because that's not what they would normally be strong in. All right, so we're, learn we're teaching a physical skill. At some level, we're teaching a physical skill. You have to be able to do this thing in response to the commands that are coming in. And three phases for this. We go through the cognitive 
phase, which is the slow, I'm thinking about it, I know that the next thing I have to do is turn left, and then maybe I have to step to a wave, and then I have to, whatever. Okay, so that cognitive phase, identifying and developing the component parts of the thing. Then an associative phase, where you're linking them together into some smooth body action. And then the autonomous phase, where you know, I'm sure all of you, you don't even think about right and left through and what you're actually doing. It just happens, right? So that's to be thought of, that you have to give dancers time to work through those phases, and you have to give them enough uh, uh, drill to let it happen. And how many times do we say? Harlan's got it in your stuff. 23 times to... Um, this has to do with some research I did a long time ago. But for people to internalize a motor activity, they need to do it 26 times to reach the point of automaticity where you don't even you hear it and you, you know, you hear relay the deuce and you do the whole thing, or you hear right, left, through. It takes 48 successful trials for the average adult. And consequently, when I teach a new call, whether it's a new call at my basic class or at, at my plus class or my advanced or China, the night I teach a new call, I use that call 48 times, and I keep data on it because I'm a data person. <laughs> lot. Use it a lot. <laughs> Bottom line, use it a lot. That's going to seem like a lot. All right. So, But you don't want it exactly the same. So I'm sure he varies how he gets in and how he gets out. And so they see different applications, but they're still getting to see that one new thing back over and over again. Okay, I want to go on to this Witkin model of approaches to understanding because this is a second thing that I have found to be very relevant. So we have people that they say are analytic. They focus on the details. They learn alone. They need neatness. They can ignore distractions, dislike interruptions, work on one thing at a time, want to be prepared, self-motivated, evaluate quality, they like to be evaluated, note that one. They want to correct their mistakes, and they're logical and organized. Okay, so they focus on details, and they like to be corrected. Those are the two keys to things that we do. Versus the global person who focuses on the overall picture, cooperates, functions amid cluttered, easily distracted, and so forth down here, but we get down to this, avoids individual competition, takes criticism personally. Okay, so now we've got somebody that's in the wrong place. It sure helps if you know whether this person wants to be corrected or is going to get upset. <laughs> okay? And the other th thing to carry away is some people focus on the details. So analytical learners listen first for details, and often remember the exact words, sometimes miss the grand plan. So they have to get the parts first and then they get the whole, whereas global learners listen first for what's to be done and, they, and then they want to find out how to do it. So they view all the parts as being related and only clarify the details after they understand where it fits in the whole picture. So what does that say about what you have to do? When you start to teach a new call, the global learner needs a global picture. The analytical learner does not really want that global picture at that moment. So in my mind, that tells me that you need to give a global picture, but you don't want to spend too long doing it. Then you teach the details, and then you give a summary, which helps the analytical learner. All right, so you've got three pieces here. Global picture, but don't talk too long, because you'll totally lose the analytical learner. Then the d details of what you're doing, and then the big picture again. Yeah. So two kind of observations on that. As you were reading both of them, I was about to raise my hand like, that's me. <laughs> but then there's a couple things that weren't. And then the other one, yeah, so I'm not quite sure where I am on that. But I do know that I don't think I always need the global picture. And sometimes when callers are about to teach a new call, they would tell me something that just made no sense at all to me. I don't want to know that. And hopefully they were doing it because it was helping other people and not simply because it was caller knowledge that was leaking out. For example, ladies' chain. 
Why do we do ladies chain? Well, one, it's a call and it's a dance action, but two, we use it to move to swap the girls in Don Beck's mental image system. It's to cause an X to happen. So no one learning swing through needs to know it's an X. I often do tell people when I teach ladies chain, because I make a little joke of it, you all have been dancing with the same partner the whole time. Maybe you want to dance with someone else. I'm going to find a way to get that girl over there and this girl over here. We're going to learn ladies chain. This is what it's going to do, blah, blah, blah. So I do know there's times when callers tell me stuff when I'm learning a call that to me, like uh, Relay the Deucey. If Relay the Deucey, if you told me you're going to start here and you're going to end up on the opposite side of the square, to me that's a caller thing. Maybe it helps a kinesthetic learner. I don't know. But it doesn't do squat for me. To tell me on Relay the Deucey I have a buddy and I'm going to interact with this buddy many times throughout the call, I find that a good checking thing and that helps me a lot. Yeah, so so that kind of information, certainly the going from one corner to the other, I think that's very relevant to a kinesthetic learner for them to kind of have that sense or or for the spatial for the person who visualizes spatially what's happening, that they really want to know that oh, this I'm going to end up over there and with this person and not only that, but that's useful down the road because you know when something's gone wrong and when it hasn't gone wrong. Okay, I'm running out of my time, so I'm just going to skip forward to page 7 here. Much of what's in between you can read for yourself and probably gain as much as you can learn from hearing me say it. So please do go back and read that. But the reason I'm skipping to page 7 is this is an example of how I might describe a call and try my best to get my information across to more than one kind of learner. All right, so we're doing a square through. Next call is square through. So we have four people. Actually, if I have, if I do the the heads do a square through, then that gives at least the side dancers an opportunity to observe, see it in action. So four person call, and we will begin with the heads working in a box in the middle of the set. What is that doing? A bit of a global picture. All right, and also kind of giving them a general classification. All right, four people are working together. What's the place that this is happening and so forth so that the, the visual uh, spatial person has some sense of what's happening. Now, each of the dancers in the box will be walking along the sides of a square, hence the name, square through. So now they have something to associate that name with so to kind of give that memory game here. Let's see if I can imprint the name connected to the action. So men, from this position, men will be moving clockwise. So notice that I'm not saying men are always moving clockwise. I'm simply saying in this case, men will be moving clockwise because you're of the side you're starting on, and that will be common, but not always. And ladies will be moving counterclockwise from this position. So I'm being careful about not imprinting it in a solid way. Each time you meet another dancer, you'll pull by using alternating hands. So that's kind of a global picture of what's going to happen. We're going to move around, going to alternate hands. Heads, take note of your corner, or over there, depending on which side you're on. You will be facing them when the call is complete. So that's kind of the, the check of, all right, I'm going to come back here somehow. Sets so up a known ending. Heads with the opposite dancer. Right hand pull by, making sure to let go just as your shoulders pass. That's a trick that I've learned about square through because as a woman starting on right hand pull by, if I don't let go, then I get my body twisted away from the direction I need to turn next. So I want that hand released immediately, and that's really important. I you know, see the dancers turning out. Well, it's because they're not letting go. Um... Okay, so we've gone by, this is square through one. Then heads turn in toward the active dancer beside you and with the person you are now facing who happens to be your partner, so that's the original partner, so that's confirmation of that they're okay. Left hand pull by, again letting go with shoulders pass, and this completes, completes square through two or half square through. Then we do it again, turn in towards the center, and notice that I'm saying turn in and pull by. I'm not saying pull by and turn in because I want at the end the last one to be 
turn in and pull by because that's where square through stops. Okay. Uh, heads turn in a quarter towards the center. Men are turning right. Girls are turning left each time. So I'm just helping what's happening out there. And with the person you're now facing right hand pulled by, notice that you're alternating hands. And this completes square through three quarters or three. So we've got two possible names here. and Let's let them know what's happening. You should be facing out toward the head walls. That's confirmation for the people that are wall oriented that all is well and kind of got the visual sense. Well, I've gone three quarters of the way around here. Okay. And now complete it by turning in once more and pulling by your original partner with the left hand. This is called square through or square through four. So we get lots of information in there. And it'll have to be repeated. It's not all going to sink in the first time. But you, you begin to get a sense of, I'm trying to cover the bases as much as I can. Square through should feel like a small wrong way right and left grand with squared off corners. Imagine driving around the block. Giving them, trying to give them some visual sense of what's happening here to help the tactile learner and the global summary. And then I would repeat it all for the sides, and that gives the heads a chance to kind of watch this happen if they didn't quite get that the first time. All right, so I'm running out of time, and I'm going to turn it back to Clark. Please, if you have a chance, look at the other information that I haven't talked about directly because there's lots of more hopefully useful information there for you to carry away. And here's Harlan. Okay, um, I'm going to go over a couple of things and I really want to talk a little bit more about learning modalities and try not to be redundant. And then I want to talk about um, something I call depth of instruction. One of the things I really found out, and if you were in the PLUS committee, you probably heard me going on about this, is that um, callers unknowingly, by the way they teach or the way they don't teach, handicap their dancers so their dancers don't learn thoroughly. And hopefully by taking some of the things into consideration I'm going to talk about, um, we as caller instructors can begin to move away from that. Um, I'd like you to turn in my packet to page four that says learning modalities and square dancing at the top. Um, as Dottie said, there is a wide range of views on learning modalities. Some people think there's two or three, some people think there's 14 to 16. Um, in the research I've done, I really focus on six main ones. And um, what I've done on this chart here is I've taken each modality and um, starting with the aura, which is um, l learning through hearing and listening, listed general characteristics of the modality. But then in the final column, the right-hand column, is what that looks like in terms of a person learning square dancing. And when I do my instruction, I design my instruction to try to hit every one of the modalities. I'll just kind of tell you how as I go through it. So for a um, person who learns through hearing and listening, in square dancing, they're the dancer. And you'll, as we go through these, you'll think, OK, you know, that's Jerry, that's Barb. That's Linda. That's Johnny. Anyway, so um, the person who learns through listening, the oral learner, um, remembers what the caller talks about, can learn calls and concepts by listening to tapes, likes the music aspect of square dancing, easily follows directions and cues given by the caller. Unfortunately, they also get to rely on cues, so we have to watch about over cueing there. Um, they will learn a de definition if it's presented to them verbally, and they will repeat definitions out loud when they're doing the call. And you know that you know your learners right there, right? Then the gra graphic comprehensive learners are, and I'm one of these, really can take a book, read the definition, think about it, and internalize that definition. And um, you see, these are the dancers who, after they've learned basic, can go on to plus, advanced, to C1, mainstream, before that, just by reading the definition book and saying, OK, you do this, you do this, you do this. OK, I got that. You do this, do this. And one example is um, I was once going to call an advanced dance, and there was this young man sitting there reading the advanced definition book as I came in. And he said, OK, finish that. I'm ready to dance this. 
and he got up and danced flawless advanced and he had just read the book and it was his very first time dancing advanced so graphic learners you know you can study books and um, go out and do that and we have some of those uh, the kinesthetic learner you can when you're in a square dance class you can pick them out they start moving when you put on the music they are the ones who really start bouncing around. They are the ones who sometimes bounce too much in basic class, and you have to tell them, don't bounce, walk. Um, they like to walk through calls. They like the feeling of walking through calls. They dance by feel, which as they move on to other programs where it gets more complex is actually a challenge for them because they have to feel how every call moves. Um, they really like the movement in square dancing. They might enjoy pushing checkers through calls because there's a kinesthetic aspect to that. They will also ask to be walked through. They're the ones who come and say, could you walk me through that call on the break? And Or they will ask other dancers to help them walk through a call on the break. Again, you're picking out you know, which dancers you've had in your class that. They have difficulty oftentimes when a call is presented from a new formation they haven't had it in because they're used to, the, they internalize the movement. So where an example, this is a challenge to that. Tally hole can be done by at least, from at least 32 different formations and there's four parts to it. So a kinesthetic learner has a real hard time going and internalizing all those different ways of moving through it. Visual modality. This is the answer I was talking about earlier, who really has to watch a call. And um, so they are often the dancers who, after you've taught a call, want to sit out and watch someone do it or ask people to demonstrate it for, it, for them and watch it. And they are often the ones who say, I can't learn by reading a call. I have to see it done. Okay. Then moving on to... The um, interactive, uh, these are people who learn by interactions with others. They, and and you, will, you will see these dancers, I'm sure you've seen that. They talk to themselves, repeating what the caller has said, okay? They will repeat a definition to others and ask the others if they have it right. They will ask others to explain a call to them. They're the dancer who comes up to you after you teach a call because they like interaction and will ask you 48 questions about the call. Okay, They will engage the square in talking about the call, sometimes while you're teach, trying to teach it, which can be difficult. And they like verbal things. They, like, they are the ones who always say hinge, fold, follow, peel when you say linear, action, linear cycle, not linear action. Then um, analytical mathematical learners in square dancing, they want to talk to you about the details of each call. They easily understand definitions and apply them. They understand how fractions of calls work. They ask questions about the range of ways that you can do calls. There's the kind of, you teach a new call and they say, you, you could also do that from here too, okay? And you could do it from here. You could do it. And I'm sure this happens a whole lot at tech squares. Um, and you know, and um, they all, and they'll come up, can you also do it like this? And they develop a whole set of questions based on their analysis of the call. So here's what I do. I present new calls verbally and walk people through them. That gets the oral going and the kinesthetic going. I also, with a whole lot of calls, particularly at basic class, not so much at my higher levels, but at basic class, I always have two couples that are with me in, in class, I identify them at the beginning of class or angel type couple who can demonstrate it. So I can actually then for the visual learners say, okay, and this actually the first night where you do the big circle left, big circle right, alaman left, right, left, grand, go around the big circle, shake hands, say hello there, everybody. Then um, I teach promenade and then I leave them in the big circle because the next thing I'm going to teach is right, left, through and I have two couples in the center and I have them do right, left, through. And I have everybody watch that. Then I have everybody do right, left, through. I also, for all my classes, basic through C3, um, and I teach all of those classes pretty much every year, send out weekly before class definitions and diagrams of the calls and a short one to two sentence definition of the calls, which says this is the, what should run through your head when you hear the call. That's for the graphic learners and the analytical learners. And so I try to put all those together in order to um, 
ensure that I'm covering every learning modality. And again, if you go through the, this list I gave you, you can probably, like I said, pick out, you know, that's Miriam, you know, that's Oz, and there's Clark. And you've seen all these different dancers in your classes. And I just want to check the time, okay? So, um, and I actually do lesson plans. I, you know, being an educator and being a principal who used to fire teachers if they didn't do lesson plans. I do lesson plans for classes, and I've been I've been teaching square dancing for 31 years, and I do fresh lesson plans for every new group of classes every year, and I tweak those um, as I do them based on wh what kind of learners I see out in my class. This year I had that one really visual learner who likes to sit out every other tip and watch it. I do some special things in my lesson plans to make sure I address her. Um, and it's not that hard and it keeps your, your thinking fresh too. The other thing I want to talk about, and this is a little bit away from um, the focus here, is depth of learning. I believe that there's a whole lot of callers who are really good callers and really bad teachers. And the main thing they don't do is they, because as callers, they know calls so well, they do a real cursory teach and they don't go in depth. And I believe that um, you really need to go in depth to ensure that every student in your class internalizes every call and can do it with automaticity. And again, part of that is doing each call enough times that people do internalize. And so way back when I was working on my master's, um, I went to a conference with a professor. I was his teaching assistant. Um, and I got to meet Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom, if you're a teacher, you know who that is. If you're not a teacher, you've never heard of it. He developed something in the 70s called Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning. And it's a hierarchy of how people learn. And I got to meet Bloom and I said, oh, this is such an honor to meet you. You know, I, I just love your taxonomy. And he goes, God, that damn taxonomy. That's the, the only, it took me 20 minutes to come up and write it. And that's the only thing people ever remember about me. You know, he said, I've done a lot more research. That's a lot better. You should look at it. I said, Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Okay. Anyway, so any, if you turn over to the page that says Bloom's Taxonomy Applied to Square Dancing, um, there are different levels of learning, and I find that a lot of callers teach to the first two levels, which don't get to any real depth. So if you look at the very first level of Bloom's Taxonomy, it's the knowledge level. And in terms of square dancing, that means the dancer has a basic rote understanding of the call, recalls how to execute it from a, in a basic form. And so in terms of looking at what that looks like, that means they can execute the call from memory, they have some knowledge of the definition, and I put a note there, callers who stop at this level handicap their dancers and keep them from being good dancers and having fun because the dancers don't have full knowledge of the call and sooner or later they're going to get, hear the call from a place they don't know it and they're going to break down. And no dancer likes to break down, trust me. The second... Yeah. Some of us were just in the PLUS committee meeting and we were lamenting the decline of the quality of plus dancers and the ability to go to someone else's plus dance and get the floor through and can they do a standard relay the do see or what have you and using this taxonomy i would argue that what we were talking about is many dancers at plus dances who who aren't even up to this knowledge state here some of them are being pushed and pulled through. Some are don't don't have any idea what a definition is or what it means. So um, we may not even be up to that level on many of our dances, dancers, possibly because of how quickly we're rushed to teach to our destination. Yes, and so I'm going to take, go through these kind of classes because they're a lot, but I want you to look through them. And I really think that at minimum. At mainstream, we need to go through the application level. And at each program higher, we need to move all the way through. And um, so the comprehension level is when you can explain in your own words how to perform a call. 
You can translate hearing the call and executing it in all its common setups and formation. And you can clearly explain what the call asks the dancers to do. We need to get dancers at least so they comprehend fully and don't just dance by feel, don't get pulled through squares. And so um, I really think, and again, I made a note there, it's interesting the number of dancers we graduate without ensuring that they've reached this level. Application level is what I think is the minimum target level in a beginner or mainstream class. And that's where you develop the skill so that you can apply the definition to a range of common setups. You can execute the call from all positions. You can explain how the call is done from some unique and unusual setups too. And I've given you some key words with there. And so here they apply, they change, they demonstrate. And again, the note is, I believe this is the minimum level that you bring a square dance class to. Your students, when you're done teaching them, especially if you take it into account their learning modalities and address those, should progress through the application level of a call. Otherwise, they are not going to be able to go out to any festival and always be successful. So uh, that's our goal. And it, that's our job as teachers. That you know, It's not their job to automatically learn the level. It's our job to ensure we support them through that level. The next level on the um, hierarchy is the analysis level where you can separate a call into its component part and apply this knowledge to novel setups and uses of the call. If you're teaching an advanced or challenge class, you at least have to get through that level, particularly at challenge where you're starting to look at fractions of the calls, modifying calls with concepts. And again, I've made the note there, this is the level that's pretty minimum if you're teaching through the advanced or challenge um, programs. Synthesis. Synthesis is a very high thought of level and that's where you build a structure for generalizing the definition of the call to complex and challenging choreography. This is where your take no prisoners dancers should be. You know, if, if you want to be a strong dancer who can handle pretty much anything that's ever th thrown at you, you need to go through the synthesis level. And the last one is the evaluation level where you can make judgments about the complex uses of the call and engage in evaluation analysis. This is where callers should be on any call they teach. If you're teaching a call, you need to understand that call at the evaluation level. So you as a caller, if you're teaching you know, basic class, you need to get through those first 50 and understand them at the evaluation level. Because I will tell you, one of the worst things I think for a caller to have is have a dancer come up f and say, say you're teaching plus and have a dancer come up and ask you a question about an extension of a plus call and have you say, I don't know. You have to be, so callers, you got to work through the evaluation level. So I just want to go on to a couple of quick things. So we talked about automaticity. Um, automaticity if you're a really good dancer, you dance with automaticity. You hear a call and you do it. You don't hes hesitate. You do it right on the beats of music. And again, for someone to build automaticity with a call, they need to be have danced that call 48 times successfully from most positions. That's why, again, when I introduce a new call, I use it from a whole bunch of different positions, and I keep data that um, I use that call 48 times that night. And if you think... In a tip, you have eight to ten sequences. You're teaching a two-hour class. Using the call once a sequence that night will get you through the 48 uses of it. Um, a couple of little bonus things I want to talk about. I believe in this thing called brain groove. It's a term I made up myself. And it has. I gave a really good ex example, I think. I hope it was a good example. In the plus three, Sometimes we do not vary what we do. We always do recycle right hand waves, boys on the ends. If you do it 48 times that way, people will internalize that's the way you do the call. So if you do head square through four, slide through, pass the ocean, swing through, recycle, girls on the end of right hand waves, the floor will drop. 
However, if you've done it with girls on the, if you're the first 48 times, you've done it 24 of those times with boys on the end of the waves and 24 times with the girls, they will have generalized that you can do it anyway and they will be able to do that. So when I teach recycle, the first time I do it, I do it with boys on the end of the waves. Second time I do it with girls on the end of the waves. And I go back and forth all night. I do it with girls together, boys together. And there are some people, um, in fact, this came up in the PLUS meeting, that think, you know, that's too hard and complex. And my point is, if you do it that way, doing it all position is easy for people because they've done it from the time they got in waves. If you don't do it that way and you only do it with boys on the end of the way, they will become handicapped and they will not be able to do that call if girls are in their wave. And um, something to think about. So avoid developing brain grooves. Vary who's on the ends of waves and who um, does the call. And um, if you read through here, you'll see some more on it. I want to go down to one last thing. And this has to do with quality of instruction. I know that the average adult will not attend to someone talking, and of course we violated the rule here today, for more than four minutes. If I'm talking to you on how to do recycle um, for more than four minutes, you're gonna stop listening, okay? So I very, very precise, precisely, when I'm teaching a new call, rarely take over two minutes sometimes three, never four, before I actually get dancers moving and dancing. I do not, and I, one of the worst things I ever saw, I went to visit a caller, a new caller who was teaching a C1 class just out of curiosity, and he talked about a call, Scoot and Plenty, for 23 minutes with the dancers standing there, okay? Then after he talked to them for 23 minutes, and they were like, you know, getting fatigued from standing and checking their phones and, you know, looking at the ceiling. He then called a 17-minute tip. So they were out there for over half an hour, and it was an absolute disastrous tip because no one listened to what he said after four minutes. So any talking you do with people standing and listening, particularly if there are people who are not listeners, people who are not oral learners, no one's going to be paying attention to you after four minutes, except maybe a couple of those. So keep your lecturing kind of things under three minutes, and you can do that. It works really well. And um, just a final horror story. This is why um, I talk so much about doing things from varying positions. I got a call. And there was this club in my area who had recently graduated from mainstream, and they came down to a dance that I was calling at, and um, they struggled. And so they asked me to come up and do some workshops to help them so they could go out to dances and not struggle. And they said, one of the main things you did that we didn't do, you did um, recycle with the girls in the boys' position. And, and so... <laughs> This is like a really true story. So I went up to a really nice group of people, and I went up and so I, I to call this the first workshop, and we did just some easy stuff for about five minutes, and I said, head square through, four, slide through, pass the ocean, swing through. Now, I've been told that you one of the things you really wanted to look at was recycle with girls on the end of the way. I said, but I trust that you guys know something about this, so... I'm going to call it cold without any assistance and just see what you do. So get ready. I'm going to call recycle. And I called recycle. There were three squares on the floor. All three squares did exactly the same thing. And all three squares did something I wasn't expecting. <laughs> and so I looked at them. I said, that's really cool because you all did the same thing, but it's not what I was expecting. Could you tell me what you think the definition of recycle was? And they said, girls, you turn back, wheel and deal. That's why we have to teach from all positions and make sure that people know the real definitions of calls and learn those through whatever learning modality they learn through best. So my, car, my question is to you, Bob Riggs from uh, Colorado. Um, in the groove part of your, your discussion, 
the 48 times really relates to the concept of the call that you're talking about, yeah. not the particular starting formations. No, so starting varying the starting formations. So you're talking about effectively the whole call and all of its division positions and all of its starting formations to make up that 48, not 48 from each of the potential starting no, formations. No, not 48 times with boys on the end. 40, because I will tell you, if you do it 48 times with boys on the end, they will get the brain groove. But if you do the, the first time with boys on the end, and immediately, I immediately do the second one. I say, this time we're going to do it with the girls doing the cross fold. And that's the very second time they've done it. So they've done recycle two times, one with boys on the end, one with girls on the end. So over the course of the night, I will do 48 recycles, sometimes boys on the end, sometimes girls on the end, sometimes girls together, sometimes boys together. Okay. And the, the point of clarification is I don't think people get that. They get the fact that uh, when people hear this in general and when people are listening to the tape, um, they get the fact that they need lots of repetition, but they assume it's repetition from each starting formation or each of those. And, and I think the fact that you're teaching, you're doing the 48 within the entire concept yeah. from all the formations is an important point. Yeah, and, and a good example of that is how I teach walk and dodge. Um, because I teach walk and dodge from right-hand waves, and you see from head square through four, touch a quarter, okay? So walk and dodge, then girls you turn back, walk and dodge, boys you turn back, walk and dodge. So the first four or five times they've done walk and dodge, they've been walkers half the time, they've been dodgers half the time. And again, I found that if you do it that way, they don't develop the brain growth and they think it's natural. They don't think, you know, it's like the same group I went up where they did the weird recycle, there was a question about scoop back. And the first time I did it with the girls as trailers, someone said, I've never done it from the boys part before. And, you know, well, you know, there's about seven calls where it matters if you're a boy or a girl and until you get on to some higher level programs. So yeah, don't build brain grooves, vary it. Don't do it. You know, it's, you're defeating yourself if you do it exactly the same way 48 times. And but but, okay. I I don't debate the fact you have to repeat. And certainly my personal instinct would be to do, just as he was doing. And we'll do it from here, and then we'll vary it slightly, and we'll do it from there. And make sure that you see th these different applications of the definition. However, the reason that I originally discovered about kinesthetic learners in their extreme sense was that I had somebody who had worked his way to advanced. Intelligent gentleman, had done fine, dancing up to that point. Cast a shadow was his nemesis. I thought he would never learn cast a shadow, and I couldn't really figure out why he was having so much trouble with cast a shadow until I clued into the fact that, does everybody know something about cast a shadow? Anybody that doesn't? Okay, so, so the deal with cast a shadow is it can be done from two face lines or it can be done from parallel waves. They can be left-handed. They can be right-handed. You can have the boys on the ends and the girls on the center or vice versa, and those all are going to feel subtly different. Okay? So I was at least sticking with girls on the ends and boys in the middle. Okay? I wasn't varying beyond that point, but even that, as a kinesthetic learner, was flooding him with way too many different possibilities. And when I finally clued in to what was going on, I thought to myself, okay, we gotta go back to square one, and I have to make a point, because he's so confused by this point, he doesn't have a clue. I have to go back to square one and put him in one position for one night, and let him get comfortable with that. And then the next week, put him in the other one, so it's kind of essentially the facing out, facing in, and then maybe we'll switch from rights to lefts kind of situation. Put him in the other one and let him get comfortable with that. And once I'd done that, he was fine. So you have to look for that balance between what Harlan's describing and what works for your dancers. Okay, You don't want to develop the brain group, but on the other hand, you, if the kinesthetic learner is dying with all this variety, pull back and start repeating until that kinesthetic learner is comfortable. Just to emphasize that, two weeks ago I was at a class that one of my cohorts was teaching, 
and he was trying to teach swing through. And, all right, walk this way. I can walk this way. <laughs> um, the couple that was having trouble was obviously a kinesthetic learner. And swing through, starting with the men on the end and ladies in the middle, worked. The second swing through did not. And he got terribly frustrated, the man, about it. And it's all about this subject. Uh, it's from California. I actually have two sort of separate questions, both for Harlan. Um, first of all, um, I was calling for one of your clubs, and I had them sashayed in two face, in facing lines, and I called right and left through, and the class members were not able to do that because they said they had not been taught a courtesy turn from a sashayed position. I was a little bit surprised based on what you've been talking about here and what I've heard you talk about in previous sessions. So I was wondering if you could explain uh, what your thinking was behind that. Um, I'm trying to, I think I know which club it was. And it's probably because that club had not been through plus yet. Because I, cause I am teaching them plus for the first time right now. And, and, and at mainstream you don't do sashayed right left through although I do it in most of my mainstream but this cl club I didn't uh, however if it were the plus dancers it was the instructor before me okay. because they are just now starting plus so. Okay. So, so you were so what you're saying is you were really explicitly teaching them mainstream only yeah. for the time being well, and then yeah and then now that we've la two weeks ago we started plus so now before we finish plus we would do sashayed right left throughs okay that makes sense. And the other thing I had was about the question about the Bloom's taxonomy and its relationship to the class and beyond the class because, you know, we generally have been at a point where we're pushing people through to plus in one year, but the vast majority of people really only learn plus in two to three years. So how do you manage the relationship between the taxonomy and the class and the extended amount of time it really takes to master plus? Well, I, I, use, I use taxonomy in all my classes, and it varies because, like I say, right now I'm teaching four different plus classes. I, this year I've taught four different plus classes, okay? One plus class went zero through plus in 20 weeks, okay? One class will take it through begin in October and won't be through until August. Um, so th it, the taxonomy, you, I use it along with all my classes. Some of them go very fast. You know, the, well, I'll just name the clubs. Stanford quads, we take about 22 weeks. Um, my S Sebastopol plus groups takes 24 weeks to go with zero to plus. Um, my Oaktown group is going to take from October till the end of the next August, um, partially because there's some unteaching I have to do there. Um, the worst thing to have to do as a caller is unteach bad habits. Uh, same thing as any teacher, you know. Um, and so that's a whole nother th another lecture that we'll have someday. But um, I can't say how long a class is going to take because different ones in my group move at very, very different speeds. And for instance, I know um, basically at um, Tech Squares, it's a 12 or 14 week course, zero through plus. So, but regardless of which one you're doing, um, the taxonomy and the learning styles apply. The other thing is too, when I'm teaching at quads where we teach very f a format very similar to Tech Squares, we do teach half sashayed right, left through the first time we, you know, we teach right, left through, and right away we teach half sashayed. But that's because we know we're going through plus and um, of the type of group it is. Whereas the one where I don't teach sashayed right, left through until um, the plus end of the class is because it's a more traditional um, teach order and class in terms of how fast it moves.
My, my question was more about the fact that for most people, once they hit the end of the class, they know plus, but they're not truly competent at it. And so the question is more, how do you expand the taxonomy for those now ex-students um, as they go through that learning period where they're really gelling their knowledge of that level? Well, um, i got to think how I want to respond to that. Basically, for most of the PLUS classes I, I teach, when keep people are done with it, they're really pretty competent. Um, I'd be interesting to see with this group that I know you've worked with too, what they will be like. Um, you know, like I said, we began the PLUS segment about two weeks ago. Um, right now, they're like doing all position relay the Ducey. So we'll see. John Marshall, Sterling, Virginia. Two things. One that uh, <clears throat> that I've noticed has been trying to make it a point to show the dancers different <clears throat> geography in the square. Um, by example, I, I'll just take the call crossfire. So often done, uh, not controversial crossfire, just crossfire. Uh, from uh, the idea of the boys on the end of a right-hand two-face line, boys cross-folding to the right, girls trading and extending. Well, how many places can you find in the square where you can do exactly that? I mean exactly that, with the boy going to the right for the cross-fold, the girl trading and extending. There's quite a few places that you can do this out of a title, whether it's each side or the center four only, or from a quarter tag line with a center four doing that. Uh, by exposing them to that early on, they get that pattern, but then, of course, then sashaying them becomes the, the next issue. But they get plenty of variety by moving them around but still having them see the same action. And then by sashaying them, I've done both. So the other thing I find that helps an awful lot is to, for visual learners, is the uh, giving them a target. And not only do I tell them the name of the call and then tell them where they're going to end up, I show them where they're going to end up. Recycle is a great example. There's a number of really good teachers for Recycle, not the least of which uh, is if you have them in a parallel wave and I ask the center dancers to hold their spot, I ask the end dancers uh, to look at what a fold would do and then look at what a cross fold would do. Those generally aren't the dancers having the problem. It's the dancers who have the traffic pattern to follow who are in the center who have to follow the ends. I have those dancers from the static wave step back one step. And I say, nigga, where you are, that is your footprint. That's where you will be when this call is over. I just need to give you a way to get there. And here's how you're going to get there. You're going to follow the end dancer and stand adjacent. One of the things about the learning skill setups that we've talked about, the different types of learners, that uh, intrigues me is that none of those things in and of itself seems to solve the, the problem dancer who has the, 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 the brain freeze on a particular call. They, they, you know, it becomes their, their nemesis call. And, the, and I tell them, don't worry about it. You're going to find another one to replace it shortly, but for now... Uh, how do we get past that? Now, the only thing I have found that, that seems to have been a big help is if I find the, in the particular individual aside in the class, who's, it doesn't matter how I do it. And we all know, I think, that the art is you've taught it one way, everybody's getting it, but a few people perhaps. And now how do you find another way to introduce it to everybody without messing up the people that are already getting it? And that's an art form. I really think that's true. You can find a way to do that. You've done a good job, but then there's still the ones who won't get there. <clears throat> My best uh, approach at that has been to try to get to know them and find out what they do or what they did for a living. And when I have some sense of that, I can often talk in their terms. Um, we have triangles at C1. I had a fellow who could not do them, couldn't see them. Because how many times do we have calls that are the dancer view of the call versus the caller's view. Lots of times calls that we don't think are going to be particularly difficult is that our view is completely different than it is from what's inside the square. <clears throat> I came to find out the gentleman had been an air traffic controller, but he couldn't do triangles. But when I asked him to draw me three airports, you know, on a piece of paper, and I said, and, and we're fortunate we have three airports in our area. So I said, show me what that looks like. And I played stupid. I often am really good at playing stupid. It's not that big a reach for me. Uh, I see on movies, and they have these, these, these scopes and they, these little lines that go dotting out. You know, I said, I don't understand that. You know, explain that to me, George. 
you know, and he and so he did. And I said, so the the line's getting further apart. And they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, so boom, 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 boom. I said, so connect the three airports for me, George, which he did. Duh, you know, George, that's triangles. George has never missed a triangle since then because that was the caller view. The view he was used to was looking at a scope from outside the square, right, from outside his realm so he could relate to that. You mentioned it, Dottie, driving around the block. I had a 75-year-old gentleman could not do square theory until I worked with him privately, one-on-one, stood behind him and asked him to drive me around the street, around the block, all right-hand, one ways, all one way to the right. The last street's a dead end. You can't turn. It's a dead end. You can't go. You're done. All right, no matter whether it's two, three, or four. And then it's shame, and now the streets are to the left. But because I had asked him, do you still drive? So if that's what I have found is a good opportunity. If we've got somebody we're really stuck with, try to find out what they can relate to and convert it. And I think you'll get some good luck there. I have, I think, two comments, and then we're pretty much done. Is that okay? I have one. You I do your little one right now. Okay. Um, I did some edits and updates on the paper I gave you actually on the plane. If you want me to email you the updated, um, leave your email up here and I'll send it to you. So you spoke of 48 successful times to do a call and um, a different session, which we've had at Caller Lab and there's stuff on my website anyhow, um, is how to teach uh, Don Beck has a lot of opinions. I got most of mine from that. And one of the things he encourages is that the very first time you teach the call, make sure everyone does it correctly. Because if they do it wrong the very first time, even if you correct that and you do your 48 and everything's great, when they get in a clutch situation, the square's breaking down, and they have to do that move again, the very first thing that's going to come to mind is that first wrong action. Because there was a reason that first wrong action was there so so we need successful teaching even the first time. Um, teaching all position, dancing, teaching, showing them lots of stuff is great. Practicing it is great. But then if in the future you never call that way anymore and they go other places that never call that way anymore, all that was kind of half, at least half wasted because you really do get into these ruts that you're used to doing and then you fall back on that. So So calling and teaching in a variety of positions that has to be kept up throughout the real dancing which is good because that's maybe more fun or more interesting um and i wanted to you have one more thing you're going to say i can tell go for it um we haven't talked about it but you also have clark's paper and it's a really good paper read it right you have the paper and it's also on my website um and i kind of wanted to end do you need to say something before we end Okay. Um, I wanted to end by giving credit um, and memory to um, Mike Jacobs. So I learned all this stuff from coming to these sessions when Mike Jacobs was running them. And um, many of the resources I have on my site and other books you guys have read and stuff you've seen are all the same ones that Mike Jacobs said. This is where I found out about that stuff. So here's to Mike's memory. Thank you very much for coming.